shipping. And this is a very, very timely topic, and I think that it's uh, been very informative, so I want to continue to explore uh, some of these issues, and hopefully we'll be able to shed some light on some additional things. Mr. Hep Hepner, one of the things you talked about was the intimidation factor of these four to five pages of participation rules. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, I'm hopeful that my Plain Language and Government Communications Act, which passed the House recently by an overwhelming bipartisan majority, will have a positive impact on reducing the length and the intimidation portion of those participation rules. Because one of the things we are all concerned about is reducing the imposition on small businesses by regulatory communications from our federal agencies. So one of the other concerns I had is this whole issue of the profit margins and the impact that these requirements have on the sale of the digital to analog converter box. If electronic retailers do not stand to make a profit on the sale of those devices, do you believe that there are currently adequate incentives for those retailers to participate in the program? And if so, what are they? Well, again, in our case, um, you know, being a small business, you know, we don't look just at the bottom line. We look at the long term. We've been in business 58 years. And customers come to us for answers, period. And if, if we don't have the answers, they'll go someplace else. So we have to have the answers. Um, we did not ever think about not participating in the program just because we knew we were going to have to. So ours is more of a customer service incentive versus a profit incentive because there is no profit incentive to make 10 bucks on a, on a sale. It's going to take you a lot more time than, than most sales. Um, our margins are very, very slim. Part of that tariff issue, you know, every couple bucks we can throw back onto the, um, onto the cost side or take off the cost side helps us. But um, for us, it was being, being there for customer service. This is going to happen. Customers are going to call us with these questions, um, and they're going to expect us to know. And that's our incentive, customer service. Well, one of the things we know about your business is that it changes with the change in consumer products and consumer demand. Mm -hmm. And obviously, one of the side impacts of this decision is probably going to have a negative impact on companies that manufacture TV antennas. Or, if you look at it another way, depending on some of the waivers that are being allowed by the FEC, it could increase market demand. So as you look at your particular business industry, what do you see as some of the challenges ahead that could be directly or indirectly related to this change? Mm -hmm. Speaking specifically to the antenna issue, we have seen an increase in antenna sales, just because customers generally need a little bit better antenna to pull in the digital signals. They tend to have a um, what I've heard called the cliff effect. They, they go along great, but then once they drop below a certain signal strength, they just drop off and they're gone. So customers used to using an old um, antenna where they got a snowy picture, now can't use that same antenna. They're going to need something better. So I think in the short term, uh, things like antennas, we're seeing an increase. Um, cable wires, antenna masks, you know, to attach them to, all those things are going to be increased, um, but that obviously is going to be a bubble effect. Once they put the antenna in, that's not going to continue on down the road. Um, and obviously, the life expectancy of this product is fairly short term. Um, you know, as people's analog TVs die, they're going to be replacing them with new digital televisions, so, uh, which have those tuners already. So this whole concept of the box and, and all that's a fairly narrow, in our time frame anyway, a fairly narrow um, situation we're going to be in. In a couple of years, that probably will not be a big issue for us. Mr. Oliver, um, I understand that many cable companies are seeking an exemption from the FCC regs issued on September 11th of 2007. And the concern that the ACA and these small operators have is that the dual carriage requirements would overwhelm the limited bandwidth for many small cable companies. Do small telecommunications companies have similar concerns about the FCC's dual carriage requirements and how they impact small cable companies? Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm not a technological expert, but I can say that in most cases that really doesn't have a, a, a major impact on us as telephone providers, because in most cases that's being provided over either a fiber to the home, which is digital, or over our DSL product, which is again the strong tie back to broadband, which is already a digital signal as well. So uh, on the telephone side, we do find ourselves in a little bit of a different uh, situation than the typical cable companies. Mr. Pardini, you talked a little bit about the upcoming 
um, FCC application for a waiver of the must carry rules, uh, the dual carriage requirements. And one of the guess, I guess one of the questions I have for you is uh, assuming um, a possible scenario that would not include full relief from that request, what, if anything, is the ACA and small, or, and small cable companies doing in order to plan for how they would proceed if that Well, would I think that, that without the waiver, you're likely to see that a number of signal processing centers will be shut down, which means that form, what will become former cable customers in that uh, part of the country will have to switch to satellite um, or find some other way to do that because simply uh, – it, you simply can't afford to invest in the equipment necessary to deliver all of these duplicative uh, programming outlets. So I think that, that there are going to be some companies that simply look to refer their customers over to satellite at that point, uh, which means that there's going to be a local business in a small town that is shutting down and losing jobs. And those jobs are going out of state and potentially with some competitors going out of the country. Um, so I think that it's very important that the FCC understand the impact that this will have on Main Street America, um, especially in these small communities. Large, some of uh, within Mediacom, where you you cer certainly have some degree of size and scope. We're not the big boys like Comcast and Time Warner, but where you have some size and scope, you might be able to justify um, uh, the break-even on the equipment, but there's, there, would, there would be a disruption in services as operators either trade service areas in order to get those economies of scale or uh, look to exit the business. And I think that what we all agree here, uh, my fellow panelists, is that we're trying desperately to provide a minimum of disruption to the consumer. This uh, digital transition should be transparent when it's done extremely well. And I think much of this partnership has done that. There are a few bumps in the road. There are some threats to uh, what is now a very smooth transition process that could loom ahead unless oversight is uh, is exercised by uh, uh, by you folks on the on the committee. 